What do you know? It's time for the final session of day one of the plenary of the UEF World Summit 2020. The title of this session is Built Environment, Supporting a Futuristic Tamil Nadu. As always, let's introduce our distinguished moderator before we start the session. Mr. Azmat Taufik is the founder chairman of Blue Monsoon Capital, a Singapore-based investment and advisory firm with key focus on emerging markets. He is a 20-year veteran of the World Bank's International Finance Corporation based in Washington, D.C. Over the last 10 years, he has overseen investments of over $3 billion across various regions and sectors. He is also the chairman of the Investment Committee of the Tamil Nadu Infrastructure Fund Management Corporation, Government of Tamil Nadu. With our esteemed guest as our moderator, let's see what the session has in store for us. Once the cradle of civilization, cities are now congested, polluted and unsafe. Of the world's 7 billion people, more than 50% live in urban areas. By 2050, this may be a staggering 70%. The steady economic growth in Tamil Nadu has paved the way for massive rural to urban migration, leading to housing shortages, slum expansion, pollution waste management issues and socio-ecological problems. Chennai, whose waterways and canals were a facilitator for trade and housing, has seen a 62% decrease and a 90% increase in buildings and roads since 1980. As a result, the city has experienced oscillating periods of drought and floods over the years, affecting millions. As India is on course to have the largest population in the world, essential to plan for higher urban concentration, improve living conditions and competent resource management. Growth is inevitable, but how do we make it sustainable? Good afternoon and welcome to our panel discussion on built environment in Tamil Nadu. Are we ready for sustainable growth? What do we mean by built environment? Our focus here is primarily on our cities in Tamil Nadu. Our largest cities by population include, of course, Chennai, but also Madurai, Coimbatore, and Trichy. Our discussion today will likely center more around Chennai, but while the scope of the problem may vary, most of the issues are equally relevant to all other cities. The goal of this session is to try and understand the scope of the problems we face, and more importantly, the opportunities we have to create a better, healthier, safer, more aesthetically attractive, more socially and culturally diverse, and more inclusive environment for our citizens in Tamil Nadu. Our friends from across India, our diaspora and other tourists from across the world, and importantly, our investors, both domestic and international. We aspire for Tamil Nadu and our members at UEF to grow at a rate that on the average would be 50% higher than the average of the country. To do this, we need to do a number of things. These efforts are the subject of discussion across this UEF 2020 summit. One of the key requirements for this aspiration to be achievable is the environment in which we live. We work, breathe, socialize, love, raise our children, and generally invest in our future. The economic infrastructure, the roads, the waterways, the bridges, the business and residential neighborhoods, the cleanliness of our environment, the richness of our culture, and the diversity of our social fabric. We want to make Chennai, Madurai, Coimbatore, Trichy, and other cities and towns in Tamil Nadu a draw for our visitors and investors alike. And we wish to be inclusive in every respect. But we do have challenges that our cities face and I will mention some of these to you. 55% of world population and 70% of global economic output are from cities and urban areas. By 2050, these numbers are expected to increase to 70% and 50, 85%. I'm not sure how COVID-19 might impact these numbers, but directionally, these are likely to be correct. Nevertheless, the fact remains that our cities are struggling 
to simultaneously be economically productive, socially vibrant, culturally diverse, and environmentally sustainable. According to a 2016 UN Habitat report, one third of urban dwellers live in informal settlements and substantial issues of access to water, transport and energy face them. Our population living in urban areas has been increasingly rapidly from roughly 30% in 2011 to almost 40% today. The higher economic growth we aspire to will likely result in higher urban growth. Tamil Nadu therefore needs to plan for higher urban concentration and other growth. Chennai in particular ranked 31st among the world's biggest cities. This massive rural to urban migration has resulted in housing shortages, including especially lack of affordable housing. In Chennai, urban areas increased by 70% over the last 25 years, mainly towards the periphery. Forecasts predict that urban sprawl will swallow almost all valuable forests, mangroves, and agricultural land by 2027. Sadly, although almost predictably, we have an increasing number of slums. There has been a 50% increase in slums in Chennai over the last 15 years. Chennai is the fourth city in India with the highest slum dwelling population. At least one out of every five residents of the city's population currently live in slums. The uncontrolled discharge of untreated sewage wastes from domestic, commercial activities, etc. So this is causing serious damage to the, the rivers and the coastal zones. In addition to several health hazards, including respiratory disorders and cancers for the city residents. So why does, you know, we talked about water. So why does water in particular matter for Chennai? Water has been important to the urbanization of Tamil Nadu and Chennai city. The city sits on major water reservoirs and lakes. Historically, Madras waterways and canals were major trade facilitators and prevention tools from cyclone and floods. Chennai was known as a city of 1,000 tanks. The city has historically relied on its uh, temple uh, tanks and other water bodies to work as barometers measuring available water while regulating its supply. Management of this valuable resource and planning to improve the city water bodies and eliminate source of health problems, flooding water, scarcity uh, resulting in economic impediment. Between 1980 and 2010, Heavy construction in Chennai increased building areas from 47 to 400 square kilometers. Meanwhile, water bodies and wetlands declined 62% from 186 to 70, 71 kilometers, square kilometers. The region swings between long periods of severe drought and of cyclone and floods. In 2015, devastating floods took at least 420 lives in Tamil Nadu and caused up to $14 billion in damages in addition to the disruption of economic activities. We are not adequately harvesting rainwater. Most of that rainwater flowed into the sea, lost forever, instead of going into the city's dry groundwater reservoirs. And as we are all aware, in the 2019 drought, citizens awaited tank deliveries from public and private trucks in long lines. So what are the paths to better cities? What actions uh, must we take today to improve efficiency and livability of cities and their preparedness for future growth? Here's a simple model that has been used by the World Bank as a planning framework for all stakeholders. As we know, government policies and regulatory framework matters. So what is the role of state government at a as a critical shareholder? Resilient cities should be at the forefront to achieve growth aspirations by 2050. This will need a significant push in terms of fund, uh, funds, infrastructure, technical know-how, formulating adequate policies and facilitating PPPs, private, public-private partnerships. 
how do local authorities continue to play a critical role in maintaining trust between the government and different communities, in facilitating process and acting as socio-political medium? What in turn is the role of private sector and civil society, PPPs and matchmaking private investment with public plans, citizen in initiatives and involvement to implement individual adaptation measures? How do we develop Tamil Nadu's housing finance market and strengthen the relationship between household assets and house, housing quality? Okay. Is there room to improve mixed land use and social mix and limit single function neighborhoods. In order to discuss these issues, we have with us an eminent group of speakers from across the spectrum of stakeholders. So Mr. Raul Martinez is the Manning Director of uh, Urbaser India. Uh, Urbaser is a major Spain-based multinational engaged in urban services and the treatment of waste. In addition to Spain, he has uh, lived for us extensive periods in South America and now lives in Chennai. Mr. Pete Durka is the global leader for uh, resilience and water management at Arcadis, a consultant firm in the space of uh, creating resilient cities. Uh, Pete is a water management expert by training and has 34 years experience in urban resiliency, flood protection, waterfront development and climate adaptation. Pete is based in the Netherlands. And finally, we have the pleasure of having Mr. Prakash, Mr. G. Prakash, who is currently the commissioner, Greater Chennai Corporation with the government of Tamil Nadu. Obviously, he has both a policy making as well as an implementation role on behalf of the government and for the citizens of Chennai and Tamil Nadu. So, may I start with you, Pete? You are joining us from, from the Netherlands. Perhaps you can get us started. Given the context that has just been outlined, what would be your thoughts with regard to the issues and solutions to make Chennai and indeed our other cities in Tamil Nadu more attractive participants in our growth aspirations? Okay, thanks very much for your kind introduction. Um, as this slide presents here that you show right now, I will talk about some very creative and practical solutions to deal with urban resilience. Uh, I will do that from my Dutch background as a, coming from the Netherlands means that I'm, I'm living in a country very close to the sea, partly below sea level that has been fighting the water for over a thousand years, building dikes and flood protection, but also a country that has learned to live with changing circumstances. So we have managed a country that is both robust as well as adaptive. And these two words, robustness and adaptivity, are key words, in my opinion, for an urban resilience approach. And what's also key, as these pictures show, is a multifunctional approach, trying to develop infrastructure in the urban environment that serves multiple purposes. That, for instance, on one hand, protects against flooding, but at the same time also has different functionalities in the urban as well as in the green spaces. The top left picture here, for instance, is a dike in the middle of Rotterdam. You wouldn't believe it. But this dike at the same time also is a rooftop park. It is a pedestrian zone. It has a parking garage underneath it. And at the same time, it even has a shopping mall integrated in it. So this urban infrastructure is no longer an obstructor or a divider in the city. It's a connector between the different neighborhoods. And it creates value because it also creates additional revenues that may attract the private investors to become part of uh, these kind of developments. And the right-hand picture shows you a comparable development around uh, blue-green infrastructure on rooftops. We, in our resilient cities, we need to increase the percentage of urban green space that we have because that helps a lot in creating more livability, making our cities more attractive for citizens, make it more healthy, but also to create additional value, for instance, by increasing real estate values for the surrounding neighborhoods. Now, these are all types of urban, nature-based, ecosystem-friendly type of solutions. 
Um, we have seen in the recent past that several cities, like for instance New York, were not uh, that fortunate to be that prepared. Um, several hurricanes, like for instance Hurricane Sandy that hit New York, showed that many of our cities have a very vulnerable critical infrastructure. And New York, for instance, tunnels went underwater, subway was down, Wall Street was down, telecom was out, electricity, water supply, water treatment. And basically, all of that uh, critical infrastructure, even including hospitals, now has to be repaired. And just imagine, uh, during a crisis situation like Hurricane Sandy, almost all New York hospitals could not be uh, used. They were inaccessible and they were out of use. They had no electricity. And in the moment when they were needed most, they were not available. So another critical lesson to learn is that we have to make sure that our critical infrastructure, our most important utilities and assets are safe and robust so we can rely on them in, in case of a crisis. Now, New York currently is making new plans to, to improve that situation. And um, we are working right now with Arcadis and other partners on a new plan for Lower Manhattan for the financial district. So the Wall Street area, this is big business. Um, all of this will go underwater in 50 to 100 years from now as a result of climate change and sea level rise if we don't act now. Uh, just building a dike around Manhattan is not an option. So what we're doing is we are developing here an integrated zone, a green zone, slightly extending the shoreline. So with a little bit of land reclamation, uh, developing space for the infrastructure that we need, and integrating it, it with new green structures so we can make the waterfronts accessible for the communities. Because we do this, of course, not only for businesses, but also for our communities, at the same time creating additional value for real estate, hopefully to attract private investors. We still have to prove that we can make that work. Attract private investors so that they are willing to with us see the, the positive business case that we have here, a business case for a resilient Manhattan that adds value and that is worth to invest in. But it's still something that we have to prove here. Now, Last topic I want to address, uh, if you want to be resilient in your city, you have to be proactive. Just like I showed with the example from New York, you cannot wait, it's better like Rotterdam to act and build your multifunctional structures now. So to be able to see those opportunities, you have to see that positive business case and you have to understand that resilience adds value and brings you money, even if you have to put in that money already right now. Now, there is also an opportunity like this in Chennai, because you would wonder why Rotterdam and New York? Well, the same uh, uh, activities we did for uh, Lower Manhattan, we also did in Chennai with a big team, Dutch and Indian partners for a so-called Water as a Leverage project, Water as a Leverage for Asian resilient cities. Uh, Chennai was one of the pilot cities and a big team has developed a very interesting integrated plan for the Maran uh, area, the, the canal area. Um, it is just a conceptual design, of course. It is a visionary. It's a, it's a vision. It's waiting for the next steps. Uh, and we really would love now with other partners to reach out to potential partners and to communities and to private parties to take this vision with us and see how we could make uh, next steps here. Hopefully with also some funding coming available, maybe from the Dutch government again, or from uh, other uh, resilient cities, uh, international organizations that are interested in bringing this Asian initiative one step uh, further. And uh, that's why I want to leave my story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Um, we'll come back to uh, the, some of the points that you've made. Um, and the example of Manhattan, the reclamation plus the more integrated forward looking approach, uh, the, uh, uh, the being proactive. We'll come back to those themes because they're common. But may I then, may I first uh, ask Raul if you could please share some of your uh, insights? Uh, you've lived in many different cities uh, and you're now living in Chennai. Uh, you know, if you could share some of your thoughts. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to just uh, brief you quickly about, about the company, about what we do. Uh, we are, uh, Urbacer is a Spanish-based company. Uh, we are one of the largest companies in the world in waste management. We have presence in 34 countries, so a large experience uh, in dealing with uh, different contexts and environments. We came to India uh, four or five years back, and now we have started an operation in Chennai. Personally, I came to Chennai four, four months ago uh, to run this uh, very interesting project in this in this uh, in this uh, state, this uh, city. Uh, having said that, the first thing we have to we had done is to identify what is the situation in the city. The situation we found is. In terms of waste management, uh, still many things to do. Uh, many problems in different parts of the city, uh, waste accumulated. Um, and the, 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 the issue about the waste is that nobody wants to have uh, that problem. All, everybody wants the corporation or the different corporation to solve the problem for them. And this is very visual. It's near to them, near to everyone. So that is that is in terms of image is one of the biggest impact in the life of the citizens that they, uh, they see uh, even the waste. The second thing we have seen is that in some places, uh, such as slums, a lot of, lot of uh, many of them, uh, they have been provided a proper service during many times. So uh, as we started the, the operation uh, some weeks back, we went to different slums. We started to, to provide that service to collect the waste, to have the slum clean. And it was very, very surprising the reaction of the, of the citizens. Uh, many of them, they haven't seen uh, ever a waste collector, a sweeper, a compactor. So for them, it was shocking and, and, and uh, it was at the same time, it was for us um, a fantastic experience to see the reaction. Uh, they were surprised, but they were saying thank you, thank you for coming here and for for uh, providing that service. So that is part of the context of the of the situation we face. At the same time, uh, we face um, or we we have seen that most most of the conditions we look for in any project were in this project. Uh, I will I will say um, the. A stability, the legal stability of the country, of the state of the city, is here. We we don't go for any any tender, any any project without that stability. Without that, the risk is very high and the interest, of course, is lower. That is what the thing, one of the things that in Chennai you may find. Another thing is that uh, from the corporation, uh, with the leadership of Mr. Pas of Mr. Prakash, we saw that the, the tender process was very clear. It was very easy to understand what they want, uh, how they want, and uh, uh, how to expect also from our side from them and what, what, they, what they would demand from us. So in that case, uh, uh, we, we, we feel very comfortable coming to this, coming to the city. Also for us, it's very important uh, as for any company to have that financial security that uh, our client will be able to afford the payments. Uh, we don't have we, we have so many so many issues now. Uh, we don't have to face more issues about about the payments. Uh, but not only that, also uh, about the involvement of the of many other stakeholders, uh, citizen citizenship. People are getting involved. Uh, we are getting we are doing a lot of uh, awareness campaigns in different places. We feel the, the response from them. That is also important for this kind of project. At the same time, the, the, the size of the city and the size of the states uh, for any investor is something key. The, the site and the, uh, the uh, period of this project uh, makes, uh, made us uh, think that it was a project interesting for us in terms of bidding. So that is the reason we, we came to, uh, to tonight. And this is not the first operation we have in India. We, we started another operation in Delhi some time back, but that is uh, our first experience in Tamil Nadu uh, that have just started. 
thank you, uh, Raul. Are you are you done? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you know, you've outlined some of the key uh, conditions investors or strategic partners look for when they enter uh, or decide to participate in any uh, environment, uh, including uh, predictability of policy, stability, political stability, uh, clear processes, clarity processes, financial security, et cetera, ability to pay, uh, and the importance of uh, the other stakeholders that you've outlined, all of which are critical. Uh, Prakash, uh, who is the commissioner for uh, Great Chennai Corporation, uh, is one of the key people responsible for creating those kinds of environment. That environment, Prakash, we are uh, very happy to have you here. If you could please talk about, uh, you know, the, from your perspective, as a you're wearing a policy making hat, you're we are wearing, wearing a, a planning hat, you're wearing some uh, to some extent an implementation hat. And you're also uh, wearing a hat as a creating the right kind of partnerships with other stakeholders. Uh, so from your perspective, uh, if we were to try and look at Chennai as a, uh, as a symbol of what uh, we have to do in Tamil Nadu to attract uh, investors and other stakeholders to live and work and uh, operate there, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, and what are your plans? Uh, thank you, Azmat. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me for uh, this discussion uh, under uh, the United Economic Forum. And, and uh, in the morning, we had a very elaborate meeting with uh, uh, Sajid and uh, Zaruk, and we we were just outlining the things that the city is in dire need as of now. So while uh, you know. Uh, well, that is the background. I would like to go uh, one by one about uh, the basic requirements, the investment needs for the city uh, that is being felt by each and every city, not only by the policy makers, not only by the political leaders of the topmost level, but till the last man, there are certain requirements which is continuously being uh, unmet uh, for many, many decades together. And uh, whatever developments that we have been able to take, it is only piecemeal catering to certain portions of the city, and needless to say, uh, you know the voiceless areas uh, would be getting lesser investments, and uh, the more better areas would be getting continuously the uh, increasing investments and all that. So, keeping all that aside, uh, five or six areas that I would like to, uh, from the policy perspective and from the implementation perspective, and as you rightly put, to make the city a much better place to live, a much uh, you know. Uh, preferred destination internationally. There are certain things we need to do it on a war footing manner with a very very limited time span. For which uh, there is, of course, it is uh, you know uh, an automatic corollary that a, a lot of investments in terms of monetary resources has to be pumped in to make this all uh, you know uh, reality. Uh, the uh, the topmost the, the if if uh, if uh, I am given uh, the choice of prioritizing the needs of investments, the number one uh, priority that we would accord uh, from the city management's perspective is the roads. We uh, own, operate, and maintain around six thousand kilometers of roads in uh, the great city of uh, Chennai. Uh, the six thousand kilometers, in the sense. I'm telling about all the lanes, by lanes, and smaller roads, interior roads, and the major arterial roads. All put together is 6,000 kilometers, and out of which 1,000 kilometers are the roads that uh, define the city, and uh, over which 70 to 80 percent of the traffic flows through in and out every day. And uh, uh, each and every year, uh, we feel uh, you know, we are experiencing an unfinished. Uh, uh, feeling over the, these roads because so many players are in the city. Like we have the uh, we have our own uh, Greater Chennai Corporation. Uh, we have got the uh, uh, Metro Water Board, which takes care of water supply and drainage. We have got the Tangent Co, uh, which gave, takes care of the electricity connection and all that. And we have the telecom, the government telecom companies and the private telecom companies, which would be using the. Uh, roads to lay their cables underneath and uh, so on and so forth. And all these agencies 
are governed by our, our different uh, verticals. We operate basically in silos. The heads of the departments are totally different, and uh, the funding allotments and the timing of those funding allotments and the timelines of implementation grossly vary from uh, one department to the another, which uh, leads to uh, more often than not uh, situations where. Uh, the department, uh, you know, the Great Chennai Corporation would be laying a road and the next month some other user department would be digging that road and laying some cables or water supply lines, which means not only an unfinished feeling, not only uh, you know, a messy kind of appearance for the city, but we are wasting a lot of precious natural resources. I am primarily worried about uh, the wastage of pre the precious natural resources unmindfully because of uh, an absence of coordinated uh, you know, uh, approach. And beyond a point, I'm also fully aware of the fact that beyond a point also, the supply line or the coordinations cannot be maintained by any city or by any government because so many factors are uh, at play at, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, coordinations. So to put an end to it, uh, what we did was to conceive, to, to imagine these roads as complete streets and we, we have questioned it as mega streets, where all kinds of ducting, all kinds of underground utilities can be, you know, uh, placed in uh, uh, provisioned ductings during the design stage itself. And of course, it will entail a lot of cost. But once we do oh, this kind of an infrastructure, it will be there for a period of 30 years, 40 years, or even more than that, 50 years. So the uh, all kinds of uh, ducts and uh, provisions that are uh, ready in place will enable these departments to plug in play without having the need to cut open the roads time and again. So these, uh, uh, as a model, we started uh, one project and we have completed in Tinagar. Tinagar is one of the important commercial hubs of Chennai and uh, the plaza that we have created has evinced a lot of uh, uh, interest from very many stakeholders and many departments, the user departments are very happy because they don't have to run around uh, various officials, they don't, don't have to run around the coordination committees to uh, dig open and to you know uh, put their infrastructure inside so this is uh, one area where we would be recurring and out of the 6000 kilometers the 1000 kilometers of roads would be recurring some 20 to 30000 crores of investment spread over a period of I, all i am talking about is uh, the, the time span of investment and execution i am talking about is around 5 years within 5 years if we are able to complete these tasks in front of us definitely chennai will be really the best city in, this, in the country, which would uh, be a preferred destination for many investors internationally, of which roads, as I said, uh, uh, forms uh, the, uh, uh, the first uh, need. And then the water supply. Then comes the water supply. Water supply, don't have to elaborate with uh, so many experienced people in this forum uh, too much. Without uh, dedicated and protected water supply networks uh, meaningfully and scientifically managed, no city can be, you know, called as safe, uh, safe city for anybody, let alone the investors, even for the common man who is residing. The, the Great Chennai Corporation has 1.3 million properties, 13 million, I mean, sorry, 13 lakhs or 1.3 million properties. Out of the 1.3 million properties, even at this uh, age and time, we are only able to connect 0.8 million properties with uh, house service connections for water supply. The reason why there is a gap of 0.5 million is, Simply, there is uh, an absence of uh, the trunk infrastructure. Uh, from the trunk infrastructure, the secondary lines would come, and from the secondary lines, the houses would be connected. We just don't have the trunk infrastructure in many parts of the city. And to elaborate further, in the year 2011, the city's size, which was uh, then 176 kilometers, it expanded to up to 426 square kilometers, which means almost two times the city uh, city's growth was. Uh, more than 200 percentage in one uh, single stroke of a decision. That decision did not anticipate all these things. It was uh, taken at a different time period, whereas the needs are continuously coming and uh, you know standing in front of uh, the city administration and posing a big issue. And this water supply needs alone, uh, if this has to be met, if this uh, gap has to be bridged, an investment size of 5,000 crores is needed over a period of five years. The third, and uh, of course, not uh, you know in this order necessarily, the prioritization can be altered at any point of time, the underground sewage systems. For any city to be hygienic, for any city to be uh, you know uh, really livable, 
the sanitation in terms of liquid waste management is of a great importance i don't have to elaborate on this any further uh, like water supply a lot of areas in the city is not having the necessary trunk infrastructure to collect this liquid waste coming out from the households take it to the uh, sewage treatment plants treat it up to the standards as prescribed by the national and international organizations and to let it out into the water bodies out of the out of 1.3 million uh, properties we are now only able to connect we, we have only 0.6 million properties connected to the underground drainage network systems the reason for the gap is again non availability of the infrastructure simply non availability of infrastructure or if the infrastructure is available there is no uh, impetus for uh, the organization the metro water board nor a drive from the public to get the they get their properties connected because it is not being you know professionally managed and professionally handled uh, at uh, particularly the lower technical levels so nobody is able to comprehensively understand the dangers of uh, not uh, connecting all these also and as a result of which the precious waterways and the precious water bodies of uh, the greater chennai corporation is continuously getting polluted how much over we try this is going if this is not going to stop unless we have a meaningful solution in terms of a very strong infrastructure in place the other uh, areas uh, the other two major areas are water bodies we have got around as uh, azmat was uh, pointing out in his initial remarks at some point of time chennai was called as the land of thousand lakes the city of thousand lakes and uh, the excessive urbanization and the coupled with that excessive urbanization uh, the explosive growth of population and the immigration into the city from various parts of the country and various parts of the state as well chennai uh, is actually the growth center for the entire uh, city entire state and being the growth center it attracts people far and wide uh, not only from uh, the various corners of the nation from international areas as well but uh, we are not uh, in fact of late in, i am i am uh, you know taking a lot of uh, pride in telling that uh, the greater chennai corporations so one of the most important trust areas to improve uh, to identify and improve the existing water bodies or whatever that is left as of now Uh, in terms of uh, the inlets and outlets, in terms of ensuring rainwater and stormwater only gets into the network and uh, fills up these water bodies, but still we have now taken up 210 water bodies and we have developed it at a cost of around 400 to 500 crores. And a lot of good examples uh, we can demonstrate and uh, right in front of our eyes. It has resulted in uh, safe uh, monsoon management, safe. Uh, cyclone management and also it has resulted in good groundwater recharge besides giving an aesthetic uh, uh, you know feeling across many parts of the city but still there is a gap uh, to identify and uh, to develop the left out water bodies because we are facing uh, i mean obviously we need a lot of money and not all kinds of investments can go into the uh, water bodies development alone because as a city we have to manage so many things but still Uh, to comprehensively develop the leftover water bodies and to manage it uh, to perfection we require around 750 crores and finally the parks and play fields any city is any city can be uh, you know the, the entertainment the uh, you know all all age groups from the uh, children uh, to the elderly they would like to spend a lot of time in the parks it's a it's a place for uh, you know Uh, letting out uh, the stream of the urban life uh, to have uh, lungs to to have various pockets of green pockets where uh, it it can act as lungs in the urban spaces for that we have uh, estimated around 1000 kind of crores and again one more point the per capita availability of the number of parks we are one of the lowest in the country take for instance coimbatore coimbatore is a place where i come from my native district is coimbatore coimbatore has a population of around 17 lakhs 1.7 million as supposed to 9 million of chennai but the number of parks in coimbatore is 1100 whereas the number of parks in the city in in chennai city is around 700 uh, you know this uh, statistics gives uh, the least number of parks that we have and the demand for the uh, number of parks that we have to create uh, in the betterment of the citizens and in the betterment of the city so all put together uh, we will be needing around uh, 40 to 45000 crores in all in a span of around 5 years and uh, we started this discussions with various uh, uh, external aided agencies like the world bank uh, 
the Asian Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, and including our own Housing and Urban Development Corporation, the Hutcos, uh, the it's a central government-owned corporation. But uh, now, uh, actually, the the need of the city is the government's funding alone is not going to be sufficient. The external aided bodies again. Even uh, if we are posting all these things to the external aided bodies, no single aided body can uh, give this much of funds over a period of five years' time. That is why the pressure is on us to deliver this, to deliver all these things to perfection within a very limited span of five years. Five years itself is very, very uh, kind of greeny that I am mentioning, but unless we take this up seriously and unless we implement it uh, in a very short span of time, we will be talking this uh, for a very long period of time. So these are uh, very, very important areas where we uh, feel that the investments are to be generated from the public sector. Uh, a lot of good investment models are there, I know, internationally to attract so much of investments and uh, not only to attract so much of investments, these investments, once it comes to place, the GDP generation of the city itself, we anticipate that it will grow. I mean, I don't have to elaborate on that. We all know that a better city will uh, generate a lot of uh, financial resources on its own and also strengthen the country's economy. Uh, there is no doubt about it. So these uh, areas are right now our uh, priority areas and uh, we have uh, given this memoranda to the World Bank of late under the Chennai Partnership Programme. Exactly, we mentioned uh, the same things and uh, to various uh, other forums, other forums also. And uh, uh, I, I mean, on, on the other side, see, uh, uh, the uh, our city, uh, Chennai city, uh, has a dubious distinction of either blessed with, uh, you know, bountiful rains, which will also lead to dangerous floods also at times. Or on the other, we are we are having this extreme or that extreme, or extreme drought situations. We are we are never midway, uh, either this way or that way. So the uh, 2015 floods opened uh, uh, a lot of our uh, antennas, and the government uh, at that point of time, the then uh, Chief Minister Madam was there. She had the vision to take up the integrated stormwater drain on a holistic manner, and uh, we have successfully completed a third of the city under the ISWD program of the World Bank. And even after this uh, cyclone river, where we received around uh, 30 to 40 centimeters of rainfall within a very short span of a uh, couple of days or uh, three days, we never faced the dangers that we faced during 2015 because we took an integrated approach of constructing the stormwater drains in two basins. Chennai is divided into four river basins. Two basins we have completed under the edges of the World Bank funding. And two more basins, the northern Chennai part is under now, uh, the Prasastalayar basin is being funded by the Asian Development Bank. We have actually started the work and uh, in a couple of uh, years or maximum by three years, the north Chennai will be completely safe. Likewise, the south Chennai is being funded by the uh, German Development Bank, the KFW. We are finalizing the uh, agreement and uh, the package finalization going on. We will soon be hitting the market by uh, the uh, first month of the new year. So in a couple of uh, years, Chennai will be one of the safest cities in the world and definitely the safest in the country as far as uh, the uh, flood-related resilience is concerned. And of course, uh, the drought-related resilience also is concerned because we have carefully designed in such a way all the stormwater drain networks are feeding the uh, bigger water bodies and smaller water bodies and the excess water uh, that comes out of these water bodies again will be fed into these uh, stormwater drains. And ultimately, they will, uh, the waters will find the way into the uh, channels and uh, finally into the Bay of Bengal. So this is the plan. And one example of how holistic investments will start giving the dividends that we are, we are able to see it in front of our eyes and seeing is believing. So like the storm, and now I'm not posing the need for stormwater drains because we have already taken care of it. And uh, one third of it is uh, complete and two, two thirds are underway. And from uh, two years to three years from now, definitely I can, uh, you know, with a lot of authenticity and field experience tell Chennai will become one of the safest cities in the world as far as flood and droughts are concerned. Likewise, if we have to make it uh, more livable and uh, more, uh, you know, attractive from various other quarters, all these areas that I mentioned really needs this kind of investments. And if this kind of investments 
it will have to come in within a span of 5 years only then we will be able to see the full growth of development so this is what in a nutshell i would like to say that uh, the priorities of priorities of uh, this uh, great city is uh, line thank you thank you very much uh, prakash uh, very comprehensive and very clear um uh, the your uh, you've been focusing on the the core sort of physical infrastructure roads water supply uh, connections sewage connection etc the underground switch connection the water bodies uh, parks um, the five kind of pillars of uh, of physical infrastructure and uh, so that's that comes through the second the need for coordinated coordinated approach you said that uh, in the tinagar example for example coordination produces results the otherwise is disjointed uh, so that's really important three the need for massive uh, financial resources to implement some of these plans 40 to 50000 crores over the next 5 years which is a significant amount of money uh, and with all the will uh, willingness on the part of the multilaterals uh, and even the state uh, uh, resources uh, you will still need probably other resources financial resources from other sources to uh, to uh, work with you on this maybe private sector maybe public private partnership type of so the need for financial resources and need for other sources of investment uh, underlying all this is uh, uh, the need for uh, the right kind of vision as to what chennai could look like in 5 uh, years time in 10 years uh, the the core physical infrastructure i fully understand i'd like to ask heat and maybe raul um uh, given what you have seen in other cities uh you know that have gone through similar challenges transformations uh what obviously the core physical infrastructure is a key part of uh, of what needs to get done and the financial resources that are key part of the requirements what are the the what could be done in chennai to make chennai in addition to these factors but maybe including these factors a more attractive city to live in maybe start with pete yeah excellent uh, question thanks uh, very much well i would say um if we focus on attractivity um first object to start with or first area to start with would be the waterfront um chennai can have a very strong a very positive identity as a city of water it has a fantastic waterfront along the coastline it has the bay it has the river but it also has uh, the thousand lakes uh, as the commissioner also mentioned so there is plenty of that and you can create an identity with that making it attractive make people proud of the water in chennai learn also to appreciate it and not see it as a nuisance or as a, a danger only or as something that is a problem of course that will require a lot of work to be done but i would say start at the waterfront um, try to clean it up try to uh, treat the water remove the the solid waste dumps that are there uh, try to make it as accessible not all waterfronts are always accessible for the community and for the public uh, develop green spaces um we have seen in many places around the world during the covid crisis that the green space where people could go to in these dense cities often were the waterfronts they give a space and air to to feel free and uh, safe um but that also means that you have to uh, think about who owns those waterfront areas are they public or private who is responsible for it can we extend them how can we improve them who is responsible um what other stakeholders would be interested in in, in join us so as a long story short i would say start with the water start with the waterfronts along river and coast start at the at the lakes i think a lot of these lakes are under pressure some of them are disappearing now some of them have been filled some are urbanized so i think it also starts not only with extending the waterfront and the water bodies but also with preserving those that you still have now and start from there 
I couldn't agree with you more. Water plays such an important role uh, in many different ways. Uh, and Chennai is blessed with uh, a history yeah. of water, being a coastal city. Uh, and, you know, as uh, Prakash, you were mentioning, uh, the city of a thousand lakes, uh, that was the history of Madras. Uh, and uh, all the canals that have been built are drying up. Some of them are polluted. Uh, and if we can just harness this ph phenomenal resource, um, being a coastal city, uh, and in use and uh, have water as a, as a real uh, unique advantage rather than a problem for Chennai, uh, for Tamil Nadu in general, but for Chennai, that would really help transform the attract attractiveness of the city. Um, I'll come back to the water issue in a little bit, but Raul, uh, you have lived in different cities in the world. Your uh, Urbaser operates in 34 different countries across Latin America, across Asia, uh, and you have a perspective from a waste management, waste treatment, pollution, and other perspective, but you personally have lived in all these cities. So any thoughts after having lived in Chennai for a short period of time uh, as to what could be done and what lessons can be drawn from other countries, cities in the world? Sure. Uh, uh... First, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, my professional perspective in, in the waste in the waste field, there is still some uh, room for improvement. The corporation has started one project uh, project in, in different areas, uh, but there is still some part of the city uh, to be covered. And also, the last part of the of the treatment, uh, corporation started a lot of treatment centers. It has to be completed to have a proper um, circular economy. But this uh, nowadays is very is is very known. Uh, treatment centers. Our scope is to collect and to transport the waste, but the treatment the treatment of them of the waste uh, is still uh, something has to be has to be uh, improved or implement implement uh, about the. Just as a citizen, as a, as a new new person who is living in the city, uh, in terms of infrastructure, I also see uh, some things that can be done. Uh, the state of some roads, street. It is not easy to to walk for a walk uh, in many places. So still, uh, uh, the sidewalks, the public space in general, public space in general. Has to be recovered for the for the use of the people. Uh, you want to spend some free time with your family. And I, as Mr. Bakar said, there's no much places. There are not many parks. There's not many places to go. So, and, uh, the use of the street, the the public transportation, the the, the, the traffic, is uh, well, it's a real headache. Um, as far as I know, it is even, it was even worse before the lockdown. So we can say we are lucky now. Uh, but, uh, the traffic jam is there. The time is to spend in the car for coming to one place to another. It's a very long time. So the public transportation is, uh, is still something that, uh, I miss and I, uh, I, I think there's so, so, some room for, for improving, for improving that transportation. On the other hand, I, 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 see, I see the city uh, as a safe city. Uh, we don't see the uh, city as an insecure place. No, it's a city where you can go for many places and you don't feel the, you, you feel secure. You feel the security is not, is not really an issue. Or at least the feeling of being insecure. Uh, it's not really, it's not really an issue for, but for a, a foreigner, it's something uh, also very important. But the, the main things are the, are the, the public spaces, uh, from also from my perspectives, my perspective, the treatment, the waste treatment centers, and the, the infrastructure for the for the public transportation, which is still uh, to be uh, improved. Thank you, Raul, and I'll come. Uh... Back to a couple of points you made, um, uh, but uh, Prakash, you know, uh, Pete has touched on the importance of water uh, and the, in, in, you know, the, the unique proposition that uh, uh, Tamil uh, Chennai in particular could have. Um, so I'm going to ask you this question: 
what, if anything, is being done and what are you planning and how can all of us help in improving Chennai's position as a water city, as a coastal city, as a water city. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, see, actually, uh, I was mentioning, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, I mean, if you ask me about one uh, big infrastructure project that has taken care of the entire needs of the city uh, in her length and breadth, it is the stormwater drain project that uh, the government, in its wisdom, started uh, in 2014 15. And now uh, we are almost 30% uh, over, and uh, we are the rest of 70% is getting implemented. That takes care of the flooding related management and the inundation management and all that. And all the networks of these uh, stormwater drains that will be crisscrossing the entire city, we have anticipated uh, this much earlier. and. Uh, the, the flood waters that would be carried uh, into these stormwater drains would be first feeding these stormwater, feeding these water bodies. We are, we have taken all steps to ensure, and in fact, in this current uh, monsoon season itself, we were able to see almost all of our water bodies are, uh, you know, brimming uh, fully with water, and we were able to, uh, you know, store the at least the surface water storage. We were able to store within the city limits. 0.5 TMC of water, that is the estimated quantity as per our uh, stormwater drain department engineers. The, uh, the, it's, it's very simple, it's only the need of uh, the financial resources. If the financial resources are there in place, the 750 crores of uh, uh, need, we will in, immediately be, 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 limited be putting, in, putting these resources and we'll be putting the money where the mouth is and take care of the existing water bodies and ensure that the inlets and outlets are properly managed and maximum water harvesting can be done. We are now ready and in fact we have taken up and implemented uh, almost uh, 210 water bodies to perfection and I will be sharing all those videos and clips uh, to uh, Sajid and uh, it can be used to all of you. We now know what to do and we have done a great deal of amount as far as water bodies improvements are concerned and now we are only facing the financial crunch. Okay, let me let me uh, sort of probe you on that a little bit, Prakash. Uh, the you've done obviously a lot of thinking on this, a lot of uh, planning on this. Uh, the the need for financial resources is very clear. Do you think? But you also mentioned earlier this issue of coordination among even within the various government departments. Uh, do you think there is scope, and maybe you're already doing it, for creating a more multi-stakeholder approach in which? not only uh, the government, but other sections of society, the residents, the people, the communities, the uh, civil society, uh, private businessmen could play a role in not just uh, implementing, but also looking forward and seeing what kind of a place would they like to live in? How would they like to participate in this whole process? Is there room for more inclusion in that? Yeah. See, actually, uh, we, in fact, out of these 210 water bodies we developed, uh, we were able to convince a lot of corporate houses. We raised uh, some corporate social responsibility funds, but not to a great extent. It was only 10% uh, of the total investment that had gone into. Most of the investments came from the government. The government was benevolent to fund uh, the Greater Chennai Corporation, and uh, we have invested uh, 3 to 400 crores into these water bodies already. Out of which just uh, a fraction, I mean, 30, 30 crores or a little less than 30 crores only, uh, we were able to get from the corporate social responsibility funds and from various stakeholders. More than the capital cost, more than the contribution from the other private stakeholders into the capital cost, we are more and more interested in linking them with the OM, in linking them with the operations and maintenance of these uh, water bodies that uh, we create in the long run. Like, uh, we uh, we have already given certain water bodies to certain uh, private companies, private corporate entities, private resident welfare associations, the, the common citizens. I'm, I'm telling all these people are basically common citizens and we, are, we have empowered the common citizens by creating this infrastructure in a very, very pristine manner and just handing it over to them. Because at GCC, we firmly believe that Operations and maintenance or upkeep of a civil asset or of a civic asset will be better done by civic, uh, I mean, uh, civic people, this, they would better done by residents, better than by residents associations, corporates, rather than the organization itself. We are already on track. If I might just uh, 
I, uh, that's great uh, that, you know, you, you're giving ownership of the operation and maintenance to, uh, to those who are most impacted uh, by their lives, in their lives, by the city. It, it might, as a, just as a thought, uh, is there room also for involving citizens and other sort of stakeholders, including business people, uh, in the initial, even design stage of what the city might look like? Even thinking about how do we fund it? You know, there are, you, you, you know, the, the funding requirement is huge, 40, 40,000 crores. Uh, you know, uh, private sector, not just CSR, of course, CSR can play a role. Uh, but not just CSR, private sector as a, as a participant in the investment. And there are different models in the world, and I've been involved in many of them, uh, where, you know, um, the government obviously has a big role, uh, but also private sector can play a big role in the, in the, in the funding and in the implementation and the design. And civil society can play a role and people, residents especially, can play a role because once you empower them, once they feel that this is part of what they are, it's in their best interest, you know, you have their support as well, which can be very powerful motivator for everybody. As just as a thought. Uh, yeah, see, uh, again, uh, we are open to uh, various good investment models. And, uh, you know, I always used to tell uh, my colleagues, the more the investments, the merrier uh, the Great Chennai Corporation is. And uh, in fact, if the model is attractive and if it can deliver the needs, we are very well open to it. But of course, we are governed by, I mean, you, you must be uh, you now as a part of the government system knowing uh, very well. We are governed by certain uh, you know, uh, regulations. In fact, we are governed by the Transparency and Tenders Act and regulatory frameworks. So many things are there, subject to that regulatory frameworks which are, which are very, uh, you know, uh, sacrosanct for our system. We are very open to very many investment models, including public-private partnerships. Thank you. I'm, I'm separately, I might take you up on that. We'll have a separate discussion as to how we can do that. And maybe we can bring in some thoughts as well. But I want to go back to some of the points that uh, Rahul mentioned. Uh, we've, have, we've been talking about roads, and obviously roads are very important, and uh, the sewage system, the water, uh, and... Uh, uh, others, what about things like, you know, uh, issues that enrich our lives? For let's say, you know, Tamil Nadu has such a strong history and culture. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the the ability to walk to schools, walk or bike to uh, parks uh, for children uh, to uh, to have a healthy sort of a, a, a connection with their neighborhoods and. Is there some thought to uh, re sort of rethinking what Chennai could look like as a livable city for, you know, people of different economic segments, people of different social uh, strata, people of different age groups? Uh, is there some more thought process that might be helpful to create a more integrated, more inclusive city? Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, see, we have got... Uh, uh, a lot of discussions going on in terms of multimodal integration, in terms of increasing the share of uh, public transportation uh, and reducing the share of private transportation. We are attempting at a complete multimodal system and we are, we are also in the final stages of creating a Kumta. Kumta is a unified metropolitan transport authority which will ensure that uh, the last mile connectivities in terms of all these various modes of transportation are there. In fact, uh, you, you must be knowing, you, you, all, all of uh, you must be aware of the fact that Chennai is, is now a proud owner of uh, the metro rail system, like many other uh, developed cities of the world. The metro rail system is now catering to one third of uh, the city's area. Now, uh, a huge investment has gone into covering the entire uh, you know, city by completely circling the various corners of the city. And the metro rail is also fed by the MRTS, Mass Rapid Transit System Railway Systems. And the metro rail and MRTs is complemented by the public bus transportation systems. And we have got uh, the various other uh, aggregate uh, aggregators like the OLAs and Rubates and uh, so many other uh, you know, private ecosystem aggregators are also in place. Once the full circle of metro rail comes into place, it will uh, complement very healthy in a, in a very healthy manner the existing MRTs system. 
and also the strengthening of public uh, bus transport system is uh, going on in a very big way the transport department uh, has pumped in a lot of money and kfw has also funded i think around 3 to 4000 crores for increasing the fleet good quality fleet and so much of improved oindams are also going on i am not uh, you know fully aware of that because it belongs to a completely different department and uh, uh, the concept of creating cycling tracks across the city is already underway and we are as part of the mega streets that i was mentioning also or in the process of creating a city wide uh, bicycling uh, track bicycle network track which will also enable easy transportation for short distance transportation and from whatever we were telling to commute to schools to commute to the nearby park to commute to the nearby grocer all the uh, smaller networks that we are planning to create some it, it is there right now in bits and pieces but we have attempted at an integrated uh, cycling network system across the city all these things are under discussion but all these things will become a reality only when all these investments will uh, you know start coming in great uh, and uh, this is probably not the forum to get into more details about that but i would certainly as someone who has been involved in the investments and uh, especially at the crossroads of public and private investments welcome an opportunity to uh, have a further discussion with you separately uh, if uh, if there is scope for you know uh, further uh, thoughts and ideas on that and we'll do that next time i'm in chennai that you have time sure. um, the the, uh, the you know the, we talked about you have talked about the need for coordination uh, among different departments and i see it all the time even when uh, i'm interacting with uh, tamil nadu other states in the country you know we have extremely uh, motivated bright people uh, uh, in public as well as private sector uh, but even within the within the public sector within government departments you mentioned uh, you know different silos right uh, is there room for more work on that uh, in terms of creating a more integrated approach how do we build tech chennai as a brand uh, you know and how do we create a multi stakeholder uh, momentum to uh, to for ideas for thoughts for for uh, uh, for of course of financial but also for implementation and 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 uh, creating ambassadors for chennai globally as a brand uh, is there room for something uh, that we can create here of course is but we have lot of scope for it and uh, in fact now uh, we are in uh, we are living in uh, a time where the enabling atmosphere is uh, fully mature and inclusive including uh, we are uh, very we are, we are going to open the doors for various stakeholders right from the citizens representatives citizens collective citizens forum uh, residents welfare associations and any active citizen who can you know contribute uh, for the betterment of the city in a healthy manner and various other uh, stakeholding departments as a collective body can be permanently placed which will be governing matters concerning uh, the coordination uh in a much more better way than it is being carried out thank you. we are 100% open to that the government at the highest level also is 100% open to that only thing is that the structure and the functionalities and all those uh, you know i related items should be in proper place that's all and they need to be uh, within the overall framework of of, of your of your constraints um we we we'd like to move soon into uh, q&a a uh, session with our uh, delegates uh but i wanted to give uh, uh, especially uh, peet and uh, raul an opportunity if you have any sort of wrap up thoughts for now uh, and then of course you will be we'll all be interacting in the q and a session peet go ahead please yeah building on that last uh, point that the commissioner made i totally agree um for let's say creating early success and to have some low hanging fruit that you start with making a showcase somehow to show early success you need to include uh, the communities and the ngos and i think the process that i described with water as leverage and also the previous program with 100 resilient cities of which chennai was a member eh? was very successful chennai still has its chief resilience officer around and chennai has a resilience strategy in place that you could build on 
just to give you some examples of those champions, eh? um, the leader of the Rebuild by Design competition uh, that was appointed by Obama was Mr. Hank Oving. He was the Dutchman, the Dutch envoy who came to Chennai to show his best practice. Um, I showed you the examples of Rotterdam. Uh, it is the mayor of Rotterdam himself, Ahmed Abu Taleb, who leads by example and reaches out to his citizens uh, to, to create these opportunities. The Dutch needed a new Delta plan. So what did they do? They appointed the Delta commissioner who is the champion for that plan. So you need both those things. You need at the, at the basis of your movement, you need the engagement of the communities and including the business community. And at the top, you need that, that champion that is really a champion uh, that, that uh, is very vocal, uh, is well known, speaks out very well and leads by example and inspires. Terrific. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Raul, any uh, closing thoughts, at least for this part of our discussion? Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, as it was mentioned, the engagement of the community is, 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 is key. Uh, the engagement also of the uh, academic institutions, Excellent. The social, uh, civil society, there are, there are many, many ways to get them involved in this, to give uh, ownership of, of their um, city, their destiny, to make a, a sustainable uh, development. But I will, I will, I will I like also to mention a couple of things we have done just in that, in that line. One is to, uh, try to, um, uh, give employment to many people, especially, uh, below the poverty, the poverty line, women, groups of women, to get them involved in, again in the society, in the, in the economy. Uh, we are giving employment for, uh, then as, as, uh, manual shippers, BOB operators, those kind of, of employment we can provide to them. And also, uh, due to the last uh, situation created in the city with the cyclone, uh, many, many of the, most, or uh, let me say some of the, of the trees in many, many, city, in many streets uh, has been damaged. So we also started another campaign uh, in, with the association with the RWA, uh, we call each one plus one, giving giving to them one tree to aim, or those uh, representatives who follow this example and to plant uh, that tree in every every place. But apart from that, uh, uh, also I was I was surprised in my personal experience when I came to to Chennai. I was surprised to know some things that are at the end of the day some very very good asset for the city. Uh, Tamil, the, the, the language is the oldest language in the world. Uh, that's something that uh, have to be have, have to give value uh, to the to the state. Mm. Uh, Chennai is the health capital of India. That is amazing, and that is really uh, not known uh, for many 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 people. So, uh, as these two, there are a lot of samples and a lot of room for uh, doing another things, for getting the, 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 the city to the higher level. Thank you, Raul. Thank you. We are running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to have to wrap up this part of the session. Uh, but you've made, uh, the, uh, all three of you have made some excellent points. I'm just going to try and pick up a couple. And please forgive me if I, if I leave out some of the others. But from what I've heard today, uh, the thing that really stands out to me is this sense of urgency uh, that, uh, that we have. Uh, we have we have such an enormously valuable asset in Chennai as a coastal city and such an enormous history, culture, waterways. I mean, everything that a great city should have. And 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 there's so much room for improvement right now. The four to five years time frame that Prakash you laid out, the forty fifty thousand crore investment need that you uh, that you laid out cries out for this sense of urgency to do something. Which leads me to a second point which I think, uh, uh, Pete, you made, which is that we need some early wins. We need to do something that can we can demonstrate as successes. And of course, there are some wins, you know, that T. Nagar is a very great example of what has been achieved, Prakash. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the early wins and creating some sense of momentum, uh, you know, it, it, nothing succeeds like success. So if we can create some wins and move them forward. The third that comes out is 
the need, uh, perhaps uh, the desirability of more engaging more of the communities, the, the, uh, the civil society, people, minorities, uh, uh, you know, uh, and making them more inclusive, a more wholesome, uh, more culturally ra- uh, active, more livable, more walkable city. And the other one that came out, Raul, you mentioned this uh, in particular, uh, you know, in, engaging uh, among the various stakeholders, engaging women uh, in a more proactive way. You know, you look at the world today, most of the best countries in the world, uh, the countries that are most successful are run by women. Uh, so, and just extracting from that microcosm, you know, uh, we need uh, more inclusive, uh, in, especially women in our uh, in 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 the, in in this effort. And ultimately, what comes out is, you know, we need to together think of Chennai as brand Chennai. How do we position Chennai as an attractive destination for all kinds of people? You know, our diaspora around the world that wants to come and live in Chennai and participate in this growth. The uh, the visitors, we have a you know beautiful temples, beautiful history, beautiful culture. How do we bring them and make them proud to come here? Our investors, we need the forty to fifty thousand crores just in the infrastructure, but we also need massive amounts of investments in industry, in in recreation, in healthcare, and other uh, technology. How do we make Chennai an attractive destination for investors and and use brand Chennai as a model for that? That leads us uh, very well into the next conversation. Uh, uh, We have uh, uh, been joined now by somebody who has hands-on experience in transforming a city uh, in another country that uh, we are very friendly with. uh, And he is a good friend of ours, uh, Mr. Hamdan Abdul Majid. He is the uh, managing director of uh, Think City Malaysia. Think City is a social purpose organization with the mission of making um, making cities more people friendly and resilient and livable. Uh, it is a subsidiary of uh, Khazana National, uh, which is a sovereign wealth fund investment arm of uh, the Malaysian uh, government. Uh, Hamdan's efforts as the envy of uh, Think City started with the city of uh, Penang, which is an old, as we all know, an old historical city. Uh, and uh, uh, but it was uh, a city that uh, had major challenges when Hamdan started off uh, paying attention a decade ago. And it now, Penang is on the international list of the 10... has expanded to other cities in uh, Malaysia, including Kuala Lumpur and Jodbaru. Uh, and uh, his efforts focus on areas of urban rejuvenation, uh, uh, in placemaking, uh, a- analytics. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hamdan, if, if I may ask you, uh, could you please share some of your experiences and see how, uh, and tell us a little bit about, uh, and you know, you're a friend of Chennai, you're a friend of India's, you're a friend of ours. Tell us a little bit about your experiences of what might be relevant as we uh, reposition uh, Chennai and help Chennai become a more attractive city for people to live in. Uh, thank you, Asmat, for inviting me to join this interesting panel, and uh, I'm glad that I be able, that I'm able to be, you know, uh, join you virtually. In the past that I was physically present in the UF, UEF summits in the past, and uh, and I'm glad that I'm able to continue to participate virtually this time around. Um, I think interesting is that Chennai. This is about about two months back. I had given a, a lecture about the relationship between Chennai and Penang, by virtue that there's a very interesting parallels uh, and historical connections and so on, by which not only the culturally we are similar, but, you know, there's been a lot of things that has come uh, as a result of the, uh, co- uh, from the pre-colonial period, colonial and the, and the present periods and so on. 
Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, correlation that has come between the, the two parts of the Tamil Nadu and in the, in the northern part of Malaysia. But I think what probably, I think in the interest of time, it probably what, what I think I'll be keen to share would be more in terms of challenges for like cities like Chennai and uh, challenges for cities in uh, Asia in particular, where we have seen a rapid urbanization uh, that has taken place uh, never before in human history. Uh, the shift of human population over the last five decades has never been seen before. What took the West more than two centuries or three centuries has taken place in, in uh, Asia in less than three, four centuries, decades, or more so the last two decades, where we have seen a significant shift. Example would be the population of Chennai has now gone from about 7 million to hitting to 11 million people in the last decade. Um, and when you deal with that kind of huge uh, uh, urban, uh, rural urban migration and popula urban population growth, um, no city is prepared to, in terms of facing this kind of uh, shift uh, uh, that, has, that has been seen in human history. And most times, a lot of times that, you know, over the last, last in, the, in the last century and in the present century, the emphasis has always been around what I would call rural management, department of rural and so on, as opposed to urban management and so on. And a lot of times it's left to the functions of the local government or the city government or city councils to take care of this. And then, and you know, they, they carry out their basic functions, but it was beyond their capacity to actually deal with in terms of how this urban expansion has come. Now, what has happened as a result of this huge urban expansion, there are two class of society, two class of cities that have emerged. Cities that have made a, 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 a successful transitions uh, and become very successful as a result that they have been, been able to harvest the urban dividend. Uh, and cities that that are struggling and uh, what do you call, are being weighed down. So in the first category would be the examples of the likes of what we see in the success models, uh, Singapore, Seoul, um, Shenzhen, and even Shanghai, um, and that has become what do you call uh, powerhouses. In fact, they could, in the, in the analogy today is that the cities are the engines of growth, and cities are the one makes or breaks nation. Uh, it's no longer a competition between nations, but competition between cities. And there's another group of cities that are facing the wicked problems of urbanization, you know, where you're dealing with inequality, uh, climate vulnerability, you're dealing with uh, desperation, and, you know, all kinds of the problems of what we could be, you know, we coin it as the wicked problem of urbanization. Uh, and so cities in India and Malaysia are stuck somewhere in between. Uh, and the question is that where do we rank in between and how we make the journey? So what I observe by virtue of you know, being uh, of Indian origin and, and being in Chennai uh, right, uh, on a regular travel, I have seen Chennai transform over the last four, uh, more than four decades of uh, by physically seeing a city that was very attractive, livable, to a city now struggling uh, and at the same time trying to embrace a new future. Um, and it's, it's a city with uh, what I call a tale, a tale of two cities, a, a, or it's still a tale of city, a tale of uh, two futures. Why would you that there's one city that is actually embracing the future and trying to start forward, and there's another city that's stuck and not able to move. Um, and it's no different by what you that you know what we see in many parts of the world where this this challenge of what I call that huge urban expansion that has been seen uh, has never been catered for and never been planned. Now, maybe I give some scale comparisons. Uh, Chennai is probably the same size as uh, Shenzhen. Uh, Shenzhen is about 10, 11 million population. Uh, in the last four decades, since 1980 to 2020, uh, Shenzhen has gone from 100,000 people to 10 million people. So definitely a rapid urban expansion. Chennai's uh, its economic activity is not bigger than uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. It is a powerhouse. In fact, it's a dynamo of the world. Uh, the poor rural Delta area has become a real driver of change. Similarly, we have seen how uh, in the case of Singapore, which is a success story about being a model for uh, what I would call best-in-class urban management. Um, what lessons do we draw from these two cities is that, that, that they have built in the institutional capacity for transforming, having a very strong plan that approach, and 
having uh, harnessing the energy of the private sector to drive the trans process of transformation. Um, you know, as much as people look at China as a, a, a centrally planned, it's as, it is as democratic what you would see in many parts of the world, whereby the people who are part of the Communist Party compete, and and they, to compete, they harness the, the energies of uh, members of the cities in which they are in, and, and 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 ensure that they deliver. And we have seen the sort of story of how Chinese cities have have been have been able to transition from a rural uh, based economy into an urban based economy today. In fact, how this has contributed to China's uh, uh, great transformation. And, and in fact, you know, you, you know, I would call in the last since Mao Zedong's uh, the uh, Cultural Revolution and forcing people into some form of depravity, it has made a huge human transformation. Uh, and that has happened as a result of, of, of unlocking the value of urbanization. Uh, in the case of Chennai and so, uh, and what I've seen in the Tamil Nadu generally, uh, we were late adopters, uh, and not as, not as early as what we've seen in China from the late 70s, but we started our journey probably in the early 90s. Um, and that journey has not been smooth. It has both got private sector to be a participant, but at the same time, it's engulfed in all kinds of institutional obstacles along the way. Um, and probably it's a mix of what I would call elite capture versus uh, what is right for society. So, you know, you find that the city has now grown. Uh, it's become a large urban sprawl. While the city government has invested in big ways to connect the city up with its, all its metro network, upgrading urban infrastructure, roads, networks, and so on, but it still struggles to achieve its greater potential. The greater potential between Chennai and Bangalore to create this large urban agglomeration of becoming a dynamo of the world, similar to what has happened in the Shenzhen region, Shenzhen Gongzhou region, uh, I see a great possibility and a possible. And in, earlier today, I heard that people talked about a, a trillion dollar economy for Tamil Nadu. Now, that's not an impossible dream, but that dream requires determination, vision, leadership, and ensuring that everyone in society is part of the dream. Uh, and uh, failing which, you know, then you you you, you fail to achieve what you, you set out to do. And you know, um, three decades have passed for Chennai uh, since the uh, opening up of what we call you know, from the Hindu growth of Hindu growth rate to uh, embracing to a new economic model. Um, but it falls short of what I would call a spectacular success. Uh, it has not been able to. Uh, while it has, it has achieved ur uh, urban growth, but it's not able to unlock urban dividends. And uh, I, I, I personally don't think Chennai will be able to to benefit from urban uh, from agglomeration economies at this stage of its development. Thank you, thank you, Hamdan. Uh, I mean, your your experience in uh, from not only in Penang, but the observations and comparing uh, what's been going on in other parts of the world. Uh, in cities like uh, you know, in Europe, like the transformation of Barcelona, for example, a rejuvenation of Bar Barcelona in Europe. But on the other hand, you know what's happening is rapidly uh, uh, managed way uh, in cities like Shanghai, in, in Shenzhen, in a spectacular way, uh, in the in broader uh, Gong, Gong area in China, in the broader uh, the Great Bay area, but also in Singapore. Uh, which also is not, uh, you know, it's similar in some respects in terms of size and positioning to Chennai. Uh, so we have, we have uh, in Chennai a, a, a phenomenal asset, uh, a coastal city with waterways, a phenomenal history. Uh, but uh, in order for us to become a global city of the kind that Shenzhen or uh, Shanghai has suddenly has become in the last 20 years, we have some work to do. One of the things, one of the big challenges that keep come, keeps coming up, uh, in, and this is related to not just uh, Chennai, of course, it's related to many parts of the world, is uh, the issue of climate change. And what is the, uh, uh, and your points about the institutional structure framework, uh, Hamdan, and the points made by earlier speakers, uh, we'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, but I wanted to address this question of climate change uh, and its impact and what, what uh, Chennai uh, its planners and its business people and civil society should be looking at in terms of mitigating or in fact overcoming perhaps, if any, if at all, uh, the impact of climate change. What are the major risks? And maybe we can start with Pete. Um, if you have some thoughts on, from your experience globally, 
uh, and I know you're a water expert, uh, water resilience expert, but climate change is part of that whole process. So if you could please uh, share some thoughts. And then after that, Hamdan, I'll ask you uh, to share some of your thoughts specifically on this subject. Yeah, definitely. Um, climate change is going to be a major challenge for uh, Chennai. It already has a challenging climate and it will only get more extreme. Uh, this means it will get hotter. You will have much more hot days. You will need to find ways to cool down your city. Um, you will have more erratic rainfall. Sometimes you will have long drought spells. Uh, you will need to store water, but at the same time, you will have also torrential rainfalls every now and then that will challenge uh, your drainage system. And you will have to deal with the impacts of sea level rise. And if you imagine that at the same time, your urbanization goes on and on and on, while you need basically more uh, adaptivity, you need more capacity to absorb, you are wasting that absorb that capacity because you're urbanizing. So that's a real big challenge. And one city that really dealt uh, well, was dealing well with that is the Chinese city of uh, Wuhan. Unfortunately, we all know that city now also in another context. Um, we're working in Wuhan on a very big Chinese program that is called Sponge City. And that's a, a pilot project that will go all over China. The Chinese government is very much focused on turning its cities into large sponges. That means that on one hand, they store the water, they absorb the water during heavy rainfall to reduce runoff, but at the same time, keep that water for use during a more drier spell. Um, challenge will be how that works out. Um, um, but the big cities, I think, will give us a good example here. The idea of turning your city into a sponge, I think, is a very, very attractive one and a very, very appealing one. Um, another remark, all the cities that uh, Hamdat mentioned in his, his, uh, his excellent uh, speech, uh, we should realize they're all water cities like Chennai. They're every single big of this, every single successful city that was mentioned is at the waterfront. So the waterfront on one hand has created very beneficial conditions to grow as a city, while it challenges at the same time. So the cities at the same time are attractive and dangerous. And that's the kind of game that Chennai has to play. It has to make, sh it has to be proud of its, uh, its character as a water city and its environment. It also has to understand that that water is not always a friend. But sometimes you need to be very careful with it. It could turn your enemy. And you have to show the world your waterfront and show the world your face. What does the city look like when you look at it from the waterfront? Every one of these major cities, just imagine the Manhattan skyline, for instance, or Pudong waterfront or Hong Kong uh, with its waterfront, Victoria Harbor. Uh, all these cities have... Uh, have their, ma their major uh, waterfront. And that's where Chennai could start. You have to start somewhere. It's not easy to start in the middle of the city. Maybe the waterfront could be a place to, to start with branding your city by making it more green also, not by fortifying it with civil engineered structures, but with nature-based solutions that, that fit well in the Chennai environment, that also respect the cultural heritage uh, that we have in Chennai, and that also maybe create more space for people to breathe and walk and relax and maybe even during this COVID-19 times find some safe space to stretch their legs. So I would say start at the waterfront. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, this is clearly all great. Sorry, Hamdan, please carry on. So I, I wanted to just say that, you know, uh, just to add to the thing that a lot of people, be, or most people think climate change is real, but it's somewhere distant in the future. I think climate change is present today. And the fact is that, you know, we need to, you know, uh, accelerate our efforts uh, and start facing the, that, what they call uh, climate challenges. Failing which, I think it was only going to be a, a, a negative factor. There are enough projections out there that say that it could between uh, affect our uh, GDP growth progressively between 3 to 12%, that your economy could shrink as a result of climate risk. Um, so cities that are building resilience are going to be able or adapt, uh, building adaptability will, the ones will be able to face the future. And that means that understanding how do you work with nature, understanding, harnessing the power of nature and building uh, work uh, and, and uh, work, uh, building with nature 
is going to be the critical pathway. Uh, you know, over the last hundred years, men and nature have gone in opposite direction. Men wanted to conquer nature, while nature has now hit back hard. I think it's now time for us to recognize the fact that we need to respect nature and work with nature. And, and you know, it, we cannot allow greed uh, to take control. You know, the events of 2015 in Chennai is a, is a, is a grave reminder of that, you know, whereby the, the fact that we compromise and use our water, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, waterways and uh, aviaries and so on, uh, resulted in having a huge economic loss. And that would be you know, 10 times or 30 times more greater in the future. So climate change is something that we cannot ignore. We have to face it today. And I think we need to build in resilience to face this. And it is all, it is, in fact, the good news is that it's all possible. There are many examples that have emerged in terms of how cities have, are starting to pay, uh, 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 adapt and pace. But it's like the two examples that I showed about, you know, uh, that it's Shenzhen or Singapore, even in the case of Wuhan. Uh, 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 in the case of my own city in Penang, we are now putting a program uh, around how do you use nature as a tool towards climate adaptation. Uh, and we are pioneering these efforts in terms of, the, and this includes learning from what has happened in Wuhan and other parts of the world and uh, and seeing how we can prototype solutions that are more localized. Um, in the case of Chennai, one of the last factor I want to highlight to say is that uh, there is enough projections that say indicate that China and India and Malaysia uh, and, and ASEAN region are one of the most vulnerable regions in the world to climate change. Uh, so it's it's not it's not something that it is uh, that it may or may not happen, and we have already seen it happening around us. Uh, I just think there needs to be willpower to put this agenda in the center, put people in the heart of it, and embrace the solutions that are out there. And, and push it forward without uh, getting into these questions around cost benefit uh, and the economics of it. Because most times, a lot of this cost benefit economic analysis is flawed by virtue that, you, that we never account for the, the, what I call the unknown risk that eventually will hit. And we are already seeing the unknown risk, whether it's the pandemic cost that now we've seen, uh, the climate risk that's around us, uh, and also the issues of, you know, beyond climate change, the issue of inequality that is eventually will create a broken societies. Great points. Uh, you know, uh, when we do cost benefit analysis, uh, very often we look at a very limited time frame, whereas cities uh, are long term uh, uh, entities and the long term consequences, the unknown uh, risks. Uh, can sometimes completely overwhelm the short-term cost-benefit analysis that we do. Uh, the second point that you mentioned, uh, Hamdan, that I that particularly struck me was that uh, you know when you look at things like climate change, uh, it cannot be a uh, the solution. The many of the solutions are out there, uh, and we need to embrace them. Uh, and in order to do that, perhaps we need to develop a more inclusive, multi-stakeholder approach. To, uh, to looking at the issues of climate change. Um, uh, and, uh, and then also the issue of inclusion and inclusive growth, uh, which is part of the issue of cl uh, climate change. So I wanted to transition from that topic uh, to something that Pete mentioned earlier. Uh, Pete, you talked about uh, water in particular and Chennai being a water city. Uh, but you know, and, and uh, uh, Hamdan also mentioned uh, the 2015 uh, uh, issues and the 2019 the major drought and water sh shortages in Chennai and across Tamil Nadu. And as you said, Pete, uh, water is your friend. Water can be a great, uh, uh, you know, placement uh, showcase for you. If you develop, it can also be your enemy in terms of both too much or too little. Uh, so perhaps, uh, you know, how do we, and this is a question coming from our delegates uh, who are participating here as was the question of climate change. Uh, our delegates, obviously, this is a, on top of their mind. How do you address the issue of too much or too little or not the right planning for water? Uh, Pete, can you start with that? And we'll come back to our other panelists. Yeah, as I already said, the, the concept that we have developed in the Netherlands, which is a, a delta area, uh, partly below sea level even, as you know, has the world famous, the windmills and the polders where people 
with um, up to seven meters below sea level even, the concept of adaptivity that we chose is to be robust on one hand and adaptable at the, at the same time. This means that you need a robust basis of your infrastructure and of your flood protection, but also your public utilities, for instance, not necessarily civil engineered, but if possible, more and more with the building with nature type of solutions uh, that also Hamdat was addressing. Uh, and at the same time, be adaptive, which means that we have to learn that we are not 100% sure about how, much, how climate change will develop. And we don't know what the next disaster will be that hits us. Is it going to be a pandemic? Is it going to be something else? We have to learn to become more adaptive. That means that every time we have new data from a new event, we learn those uh, data, interpret them, and little bit, little by little, adjust our system. Now, if you take a very natural system, you will find out that it is more adaptable than the civil engineered structure. A, a strengthened coastline with additional sand or a dune landscape is easier to adapt than a civil engineered flood wall that has a certain height. So that's where nature can show you the way. Um, I want to mention one other thing about robustness. In particular, the city of New York learned this that uh, after Hurricane Sandy that we are all familiar with, I think. The flooding itself was not even the biggest issue. The fact that houses were flooded, the uh, number of casualties was very low. But the real impact was the economic impact because all public facilities were out. There was no Verizon, so no telecom. That means that Wall Street was black. Uh, the subways couldn't run for months. Electricity was out. Water supply was down. So every single utility, tunnel system, every single utility that you can imagine was out. So that's one of the things that New York is working hard on now is they don't want to fortify the city with a giant flood wall around it. I think that's that's very well thought of. But it means that you have to be resilient in your critical infrastructure because we know how sensitive our cities are and how much or how much is needed to keep our daily lives up and running all the time. So that is the, the interesting new uh, urban resilience concept that uh, that New York is working on. But of course, you have to combine that with a basic level of robustness, both against flooding, but also when it comes to water shortages and droughts. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, I want uh, there have been some questions coming in from our delegates uh, uh, for various panel panelists here, and some of them were specifically for uh, Mr. Prakash. Unfortunately, he had to leave for an urgent meeting, uh, so we're not able to field those questions to him, but we will direct those questions to him directly, and then perhaps he can get back to us on another uh, occasion. But there is a question for, for uh, Raul, for you, that is coming in. Uh, uh, our, obviously, our delegates who especially live in Chennai and across Tamil Nadu uh, are concerned about the subject of waste management. And uh, your presence here has prompted some question to come. Uh, come in. The, I know that you're working on implementing a waste collection solution for Chennai right now, and there are many aspects of it. You talked about it earlier, but can you uh, address this question, uh, an answer to this question, as to how you plan to change the mindset of our citizenry, of our society, uh, and uh, to to make uh, to make them participants in this process of uh, you know proper handling of waste. Raul? Yes, uh, actually that, that question is connected to, with the previous one. Uh, one of the activities with more impact in terms of, of climate change is the waste management. Uh, as you mentioned before, the, many factors are global factors out of your control, but one of the factors that is in your control is the waste management. In, in, the, in the city of Chennai, we have established two main campaigns. One is for uh, Reducing the, the the amount of waste generated uh, in every in every household. Uh, let me explain just one thing before uh, the generation of waste in in Chennai is about 0 0.6 kilograms per person a day, whereas the generation of the, uh, uh, in the USA or in other countries is in between two and three kilograms per day. So more than four times more. Uh, it means that uh, development brings more waste generation. We have to we have to assume that is that way. 
So there are two ways to to uh, to fight against that. Uh, one is the reduction, the reduction, reduce as much as possible the generation in every place. For that, we have we have started some campaigns uh, with uh, 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 schools, with some associations, to let them know how to deal with uh, waste. And also, the other part of the of the of the system is the segregation, to reduce the number of tonnage, the number of of uh, the, the amount of waste that goes to the landfill or to the dump the dump site. I uh, have to say that. In the, in the dark side, the emissions is one of the uh, uh, impact for the climate change, the emission from the land, from the landfills. So for that, uh, we have already started some of the other campaigns, awareness campaigns, going to different places, uh, and let them know how to segregate, how to separate at home, how to reduce the burden of the, of the, of the landfill. So in that case, uh, we'll create another system, another 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 system for recycling and for uh, giving value, for adding value to the to the waste, not considering a waste, but also as a as a as a source, something with value. So uh, apart from that, and just from the company perspective, uh, uh, we have changed. Uh, we will try to change the, the the minds of many people also by deploying. Some different type of vehicles. The normal vehicle, uh, diesel, petrol vehicles, we have removed all of them, and we have we are just uh, deploying for the waste for the door-to-door uh, -door collection, just electrical vehicles, battery operated vehicles. So the amount of the emissions has been reduced, or is, or is going to be reduced, in a in a in a big amount. That is what we are. Starting to do to change the mentality of the people in Camila to, to reduce and to segregate the, the waste. All right, if I ask, but if I can just share what I observed that a lot of uh, in terms of issues about waste and uh, sustainability that I observed, you know, in terms of recycling, that Tamil Nadu definitely is not as what do you call you know uh, benchmark comparison with the developed world. It's not as bad, but it, it I think it's it's an issue of what. It, well, I've seen that, that the whole idea of removing plastics and use in some parts of Tamil Nadu, uh, reducing what you call uh, waste generated, uh, even uh, energy consumption through uh, wind and others has been quite successful. But one factor that sometimes is not spoken much is about how do you build trust and partnership with citizenry? And how do you make citizenry own the fact that it is about making their lives better? Uh, and I think it lacks, it requires a uh, uh, great effort to, of uh, uh, city leaders to engage and, and ensure that we, we build trust and partnership with society. Because I think that's big, probably the biggest failing in, in, whether it's in Chennai or Malaysia and so on. It's either some politician or, poli or government official who decides uh, and uh, or engages a service provider. But the citizen is never part of that process from the beginning, during and after. Um, so usually, yeah, you will send guidelines and notes and so on. So you get, I don't think you get a, a, an engaged citizenry. And, and uh, if you do not have an engaged citizenry, a lot of these issues that can be dealt with, and, and, and uh, a lot of these urban issues that can be dealt with, uh, doesn't yield the results that potentially could yield. Good for thought. Totally right. It's not excellent in our, in our experience. In our experience, there are three, three stakeholders in this sector and any other sector, the corporation or the government, the private company, the private operator, and the citizen. Without, just with two of them, uh, this doesn't work. We need the involvement, we need the engagement of the three of them. And in fact, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't go to the extent of saying that, that the whole planning, design, and the implementation should be done with the citizenry. So that they understand the whole process about how the city is working to bring better life. And the fact that they bring that messaging down to the ground builds trust and the willingness and to partner to then to do what they can within their own capacity, which eventually, when aggregated, becomes a, a, a significant impact to what they call individual. This issue of uh, 
in having engaged citizenry of the city being part of not just uh, but being a key part of the planning process and uh, owning the issues, owning the problem and owning the solutions is such an important element of a successful city. Uh, and I know that uh, you've done a lot of good work on this, uh, Hamdan. Uh, I also know that in China, uh, you know, our belief uh, in a, the narrative across many countries, including unfortunately among some of us as well, is that China, as you mentioned earlier, Hamdan, is a, is a top-down uh, uh, communist party-driven machine and therefore they can achieve success. And my own experience having dealt with China for the last three decades is that uh, while the government and the policymakers are very active in thinking about proactively the long-term issues and the long-term planning, et cetera, uh, one of the key um, reasons for their success is the active engagement of, uh, of, of society, uh, active engagement of business people. Uh, we'll come back to this topic in a little bit, uh, but moving from the subject of just waste to the subject of housing uh, and uh, you know, especially in Chennai, there is a real, uh, and, and across many cities in India, there is a real uh, affordable housing for different segments of society. Uh, and how do you, uh, is this a problem that you've come across uh, any of our panelists uh, in other cities? And certainly in Asia, uh, I know Hamdan, you have, and but uh, uh, Pete, you, you may have come across this. Uh, uh, how do we deal with the problem of shortage and affordable housing uh, in Chennai or for that matter in other cities in, in Tamil Nadu? Uh, Hamdan, maybe you can start. Okay, maybe I will talk about the experience of Malaysia and then maybe try to see whether there can be any parallels drawn. Malaysia was uh, what I call in 1970, uh, we had an urban population, three, one, one out of four persons living in the urban areas. Today now the country is 80% urbanized uh, and the large transition that we have seen from rural to urban, that we, that we have seen uh, our urban population now accounts for more than uh, uh, 25 million people. Um, and the urban population that we have, actually Malaysia does not have slums. And people are living in a, a proper accommodation with amenities, services and facilities. Now that has come as a result of the, uh, the, uh, the government has worked, uh, what do you call, all across to have plan, uh, a plan-led approach to house the millions who have moved in, in the urban transition uh, over the last three, four decades uh, into, uh, in, a, in a way whereby government started delivering a large number of public housing. And we also saw the government getting the private sector to deliver the uh, uh, large number of uh, public housing. And, and there were whole segments of low, what do you call, uh, uh, they call it low income, low, low middle income and middle income housing. And that has sort of like enabled Malaysia to house its urban population, move people away from uh, informal settlements or slums uh, into uh, proper accommodation. Uh, and th I'm just giving an example of Malaysia and how to support that, obviously, there were financing structures. There were the built industry was organized so that what do you call it could do it in a in a more effective way, uh, and then this what do you call the ownership models were created so that what you call, people could actually buy into uh, building their own personal balance sheet. Another example would be Singapore. Singapore took the approach where eighty five percent of people today live in housing HDB flats, whereby you know uh, you have eighty to eighty five percent of people in Singapore who are living in housing their own programs. That is built by the government, and uh, they renew it systematically. Uh, uh, and we have seen how Singapore has been successful to keep their people uh, and provide a kind of high quality of life. And and obviously, uh, in the case of Chennai and uh, many other Asian cities, is that um, how do we do this? Given that you do not have the institutional structure. That can actually make the, that unlock the value of working with private sector to deliver this. At the same time, government is not equipped to deliver it by virtue of the fact that government is not in the, in the business of building. Uh, and, but, but it should be playing its more effective role of governing and uh, working in partnership. 
Um, so I would think that you know uh, this is something that you know uh, there are very clear cut solutions that can be learned, whether it's from China, whether it's from Singapore or from Malaysia, that has enough success models and probably also learn from the failures and deliver it because it's it's, it's Chennai doesn't need to in, invent its own model. Uh, there's a lot of lessons that's out there that actually what do you call you could adapt and build. In fact, you know, you could build better than what it, others have actually never done to, before because it meant, yeah, they could learn from the mistakes of the other cities and so on. Thank you, Hamdan. Any, any yeah, thoughts on to, this topic? Yeah, yeah. To, to follow up on that, I think we should not forget there's a gigantic challenge here. It's not only about finding or building affordable housing. It starts with the fact that the most vulnerable communities in our societies are the ones that live in the most dangerous places. Very often the most low-lying places along rivers or coastlines are occupied by these informal settlements that uh, Hamdan mentioned. This means that when we come up with solutions like creating more space for water, room for the river projects, for instance, that we have to deal with the settlement of these people. Um, Arcadis itself did a big project in Sao Paulo, uh, in the middle of the, this giant city, a river called Rio Tiete, was widened in a Room for the River program. But that meant that we had to think about the resettlement of thousands of people. And this means, of course, that you face challenges of uh, inequality and uh, of justice that you have to deal with. And that makes it a very precious operation. But we have to deal with it. We have to realize when we want to make our cities more resilient, it starts with making the citizens more resilient, and it starts with, in particular, making those communities resilient that are most vulnerable. And that is really a, a, a giant operation that, that we, we have to deal with. Now, some cities, um, particularly those that have uh, almost no space at all, the islands like Penang, but also Hong Kong, Singapore, and Manhattan, they all think in terms of uh, land reclamation or what they call shoreline extension to create more new space. But this is also a big challenge, of course. On one hand, this is very expensive. This is a very expensive way to create space. And it also creates new environmental challenges that you will have to deal with. So this is really one of the key issues, I think, in our big cities is about how do we find not only affordable, but also resilient and sustainable places to right. live. Yeah, I probably will just add that, you know, maybe there's a newer way of thinking these issues because urban extension was because you want the fact that they, they, that you wanted to do more within the existing urban area. But the new thinking that has emerged is actually think of a more polycentric model whereby, what do you call, uh, you get, a, you create a network of cities that work in tandem and harness the potential of each other uh, by virtue of using a uh, very strong, what I call infrastructure, whether it's, uh, a road or rail, uh, you are able then to create a network of cities that are interdependent, interlinked within a metropolitan area. And that way then you deal with the fact that you could then contain your urban growth, create compact cities, and organize what you call uh, live work play in a more efficient manner. Uh, very, very uh, interesting point. Uh, this concept of all centric uh, model, uh, especially now, uh, I guess it's coming to the forefront after the pandemic, uh, where uh, people are becoming more aware that, uh, you know, creating an urban agglomeration uh, may not necessarily always be the best solution. We need to have more uh, alternative solutions. And, uh, but also it leads to the question of uh, how do you create cities that are more inclusive, more balanced, more interdependent, within the various economic segments and social segments of society. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, as you all know, as cities have developed, the rural population has come in, but the, the, the more the, 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 uh, the higher income, uh, higher wealth, uh, it gets concentrated in, the, in some parts of cities, and then the poorer people start getting pushed out. Uh, is that, a, is that a, a good model? Is that a resilient model? Is that the best kind of model? Uh, uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, where land was as considered a real estate as opposed to a generator of economic value. Uh, you, you know, any thoughts on this? Uh, start with uh, Hamdan. You. 
I think basically you hit it on the nail and say that land is an economic resource. It's not real estate. Uh, I, you, people have a right to own land uh, and own a property, but it's a privilege to build something and that privilege needs to be earned. And that privilege is provided on the basis of what value you create. It's not about self-serving. It's about what value that you actually deliver to society. Uh, I think there's a one that's point one. Two is that um, cities is, is about uh, the reason why people converge is, is about places of hope and possibility. It's places where people transact. It's the places where people innovate. It's the places where you get reality and so on. Um, it is not a real estate scheme. The problem is that cities are being shaped by real estate scheme by virtue that the architects, planners and builders uh, stake a claim and capture the dialogue about what a city is. Uh, most times then the economic direction of a city is, is actually lost in translation. Uh, and, and when the group, when you start dealing with economic outcome and it's not dealt upfront, uh, you lose that potential. So I, I look at it in the sense that, you know, uh, when you build cities, you're building live, uh, communities, you're building human lives and you're building what they call, uh, 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 uh a journey that lasts 100, 200 years. And I think it's that while real estate looks at a, uh, it's a very cyclical, you build for the next decade or two decades and so on. And, you know, when you build today, you, you get, you gain your profit and you move on. But what happens after that? They say the life cycle cost of real estate is that it's 20% upfront, 80% it's in the, uh, post delivery of a project. Um, and most cities are not equipped and prepared, whether it's a real estate owners or the cities in terms of now, accounting for the cost of managing those real estate that's being built. And I think those, these are the new things that needs to be thought about and reflected upon. Uh, the other point I think I want to emphasize is that uh, in a post-COVID environment, cities have become, it's become, a, there's a greater need to deal with the issues in cities. Uh, this, it's not a question of moving away from cities. In fact, this is what I think uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations just last week emphasized. And in a recent report by the UN Habitat, where it, the World Cities Report was launched, and this World Cities Report is uh, been issued every four years, where this is actually saying that this is going to, that in the decade of action that we are faced with, cities needs to embrace the idea of sustainable urbanism, uh, and it needs to be right, left, and center in terms of ensuring that we deliver the decade of action in terms of achieving our SDGs and ensuring that we deliver the the promise to the men on the street in terms of the kind of what they call quality of life that they deserve. And in order to do that, I believe that uh, there's a need to not think in the context of uh, land development, but it's about building great cities. Yeah, on that one thought, and the follow-up, the COVID-19 crisis may also give us an opportunity now eh, to rethink urban resilience and rethink our cities, because in particular, the central business districts that have been grown out of that real estate bubble that you mentioned may go to a transition now with much more people working from home, more digital work, also the city centers being less attractive, these monocultures of these business districts. So there might come opportunities now to, to rethink our cities and, and turn it into more a kind of inclusive type of mixed use and maybe also making those uh, inner cities more sustainable and resilient. Don't know exactly how to do that because there's a lot of money involved that is now at stake because of what has been invested in it. But it is obvious that many of the high-rise buildings in the central business districts will have to go to some kind of a transition. Absolutely right, uh, Pete. Um, you know, uh, as I as I've been hearing this conversation, listening to uh, very very experienced panelists, some thoughts that uh, have been in my mind is this: uh, some of the, you know, uh, some of the conversation has been around who is part of the dialogue, who is part of the conversation, uh, who are the decision makers. Uh, as Hamdan you mentioned, uh, cities uh, most. If you look at the land in cities as a real estate play as opposed to something that uh, generates long-term economic value, um, then you end up with a lot of real estate plays. 
Um, and and Chennai is a good example. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful city just 50 years ago. And certainly it was a beautiful city before that, 100 years ago. And the consequence of the decisions that have been made uh, cumulatively over the last 100 years is what we have today. And I'm focusing on Chennai. Of course, we are with other problems in many other cities. But, uh, you know, Chennai is where we are and uh, we are looking at solutions. So the consequences of the decisions that were made by whoever made those decisions uh, uh, we are living with today and we will live for several more decades. But the consequences, the decisions we make today, uh, we will live with and the decisions we make in the next uh, decade, we will live with for the next uh, 100 years. And, uh, you know, uh, if we want to make Chennai and uh, as, as a great city, as a part of the 1.5 trillion economy that we aspire for, we need to make Chennai a uh, more attractive, more resilient, more uh, robust, more a uh, uh, city for everybody. And therefore, everybody who are stakeholders in the long-term future of the city needs to have a place in the table, in the dialogue that takes place. Uh, and it's not therefore just the, you know, the, the policymakers, although they have a very important role to play, it's not just the business people who have also an important role to play, and we can come back to that. But it's also, other uh, stakeholders. Uh, it is the uh, I mean, hopefully proactive civil members of civil society. It's the architects, it's the designers, it's the planners, it's the common uh, citizens like you and I. Uh, it is uh, people who are most affected by cities. They, they uh, you know, by the by the problems, the poorer sections of society, the less uh, economically uh, advantaged society, the women who have to travel in crowded buses and. Uh, and uh, suffer the consequences of, of all of those things. Uh, so we need to, uh, as we plan for the Chennai of the future or the uh, Fritchie of the future, or the Coimbatore of the future, not just future in 100 years, but future in 10 years. And if you plan for uh, the Tamil Nadu of 1.5 trillion, we need to bring in all these stakeholders into the conversation. Uh, and I know that uh, in Netherlands, they have done it. And I know that Pete, you have been involved in this in a number of countries. Uh, in terms of seeing how it has changed. I, I personally have seen how things have happened in, in many countries in the world, including in, 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 in Barcelona, in Manhattan, in, in uh, China. Uh, how, uh, any thoughts on, on creating a more multi, uh, you know, multi-stakeholder approach to rebuilding and uh, reinventing and rejuvenating Chennai? Yeah. Pete, you've been nodding, so I'm going to ask you. Yeah, this. maybe one very good example. Uh, uh, is uh, the rebuild by design process that uh, was launched uh, uh, in the U.S. by by President Obama at that time after Hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of the U.S., where it was said that we don't want to have simply everything to be rebuilt as it was before. We want to have a more inclusive design process that includes communities and community leadership, not only telling and informing them about what we have decided, but asking them what they really want and make them part of the design process. And that has been a fantastic effort. It was led by a famous Dutchman, Henk Ovink, our, our uh, water envoy. And Henk was very successful with a large community involvement. Um, but we, we still need to give that a follow up, I think. It was a promising start. Uh, and, and we have to find a way now to extend that somehow uh, in Chennai. But I would love to advocate the rebuild by design uh, efforts that have been done. I'm not, I, 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 I will probably say that um, we, we need to embrace uh, our people, our citizens, our, you know, because they, what, the whole idea of being in cities has been about, uh, it's about working to deliver value for them. And a lot of times, like I said, they're not participants or, or actors in the whole thing about this, defining their destiny. So it's about how do you build a livable, likable, uh, uh, um, and I think the challenge lies in the sense that how do you ensure that you, um, not only make this tick box exercise of engaging people, but rather you get people to be part of the whole process of creating, uh, in implementing, managing, and so on. The more you build your citizenry, the more you build, uh, more you increase your capacity, 
the more you create ownership with them, the greater and, and more, what do you call, uh, better your cities become. And that means that you should not fear the fact that you, by getting people involved, that you would be displaced. I think most institutions is that people look at power and, uh, and, and fear the whole process of engaging and getting citizenry involved because that means that they will get displaced. Uh, but if there is leadership that has got vision and we got strength of, uh, character, I believe that what do you call, uh, the citizens can be brought into the table and to be the focal point of any solution making. Thank you. Thank you, Amdan. This is, uh, such an important point. Um, they, uh, this conversation can carry on for a long time. All of us, uh, who are engaged in this, uh, are passionate about this topic. We are passionate about Chennai. We are passionate about Tamil Nadu. We want it to grow. We want it to become attractive. Uh, Raul, before I, I try to wrap up, I wanted to ask you if you have any par uh, parting thoughts. Raul, you're on, uh, you're on, on mute. No. Well, yes, uh, just uh, as, a, as a final thought to say, uh, the, the city has many conditions to uh, higher development. Uh, I think the city has to give more visibility of all these business conditions. Uh, the, the English language is spoken by many people in the city, which is a very, a very good asset. But also it is requires some more coordination between all the public, especially public entities. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an issue. At the same time, uh, to prioritize, to give priority to some specific projects, as you say about housing, waste management, water management, infrastructure. But I think at the end of the day, the good news is that the, the, the way is paved. There are some international companies working now in Chennai and Tamil Nadu. And this definitely will attract some more investment, some more, some more foreign uh, investors. Thank you. Uh, any parting thoughts from you, Pete, before we wrap up? No, I think this was absolute uh, a perfect uh, discussion. Um, I think we have to find that balance. We talked about governance, about about innovations and technologies. We didn't talk so much about digital that might offer us new uh, opportunities as well uh, for solutions. We talked about uh, community involvement. I loved Raoul's point that he made earlier that we should also definitely make sure we have women uh, very much involved in that process. But last but not least, we should also not forget that the businesses plays an important role. If we really want to have successful resilient cities, we need to be competitive and attract the businesses to come to our cities. And these cities have to be resilient for that. They have to be robust, but they also have to be inclusive because in the near future, businesses will also look at inclusion as a major factor to come to our cities. So we also have to have that discussion with the industry and with the private business, private companies, what, what their vision is on resilience and what they can contribute to it as well. And that's one of the most difficult ones because that means that we will also would like to ask them to invest in resilience and the business will only invest, invest if there is a return on investment. So a big challenge is that we have to prove that resilience is a profitable thing to do and that it brings a return on investment, even though, as also Hamdat has described, it's not so easy to see that benefit in the first hand. It's not only because sometimes things are long away, but it's also because some of those benefits like health and safety or ecosystems improvements are not so easy to, to monetize and to give them a value. But we can do that. We can, we can, we can monetize them. We give them a value and we can prove that resilience is something very profitable for everybody to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 30 seconds. Uh, uh, from you, uh, I'm done to any parting. No, I think I said much. Uh, probably I will just say that, you know, uh, the conversation on Chennai, we need, that needs to have uh, leadership. And I'm glad that you have taken a bold step to, uh, to provide that focus. And hopefully that what you call your efforts will bear fruit. And I would probably encourage you all to think about what you call, uh, um, uh, sponsoring or, 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 or mainstreaming 
the conversation that we are having because I believe there are many other actors who would be part of, and be keen to be part of this conversation and be creating that movement and momentum would be would the, would pro- from probably the first step to having the right kind of uh, questions to be asked and answered and, uh, and delivered. So with that, yeah, I will conclude my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all my panelists, all the, uh, the excellent conversation you've had. I mean, frankly, I, I could carry on this conversation for a long time. Uh, and we will, as you said, uh, uh, Hamdan, we will have to carry this conversation on. Uh, but I ha- we have to conclude. Uh, I just want to uh, mention that we've had some excellent thoughts coming from uh, uh, Mr. Prakash, who uh, is not uh, present right now, but he was earlier. Uh, he talked uh, a lot about the government's plans, the need for uh, uh, building up uh, the physical infrastructure of the city, about the roads, the uh, water, uh, the power sector, power, the sewage, and all of that is absolutely fundamental, absolutely critical. Uh, the sense of urgency of the next five years, what we need to do to create the basic infrastructure uh, for uh, the citizens of Chennai itself alone, and of course other other parts of the state, uh, and the forty to fifty thousand crores that are uh, that are needed to do that, uh, which is a major challenge. Um, but in addition to all of that, you know, to make a city, what has come out in this panel discussion, uh, this rich discussion we've had, uh, to make a city an attractive, livable place goes even beyond, uh, of course, uh, the physical infrastructure is fundamental, but goes beyond the physical infrastructure to make an attractive uh, city. And we have a lot of resources in Chennai. Uh, it's a fantastic coastal city. It's a beautiful history. It has enormous culture. It has uh, it has uh, great citizenry. Um, it has hospitable people, as Raul keeps reminding us all the time that he has felt so uh, comfortable moving to Chennai and is with his family and living there. So it has hospitable people. It has a, the Tamil language is a, is a, is an asset. We have so many assets uh, to make Chennai a world class city. Uh, but this conversation uh, it needs to go on. Uh, the this conversation about water, the con- the importance of water. Uh, in all its dimensions, the conversation about the role of government uh, and the role of the private sector, the role of uh, other stakeholders that have been mentioned, uh, the architects, the engineers, the designers, the different segments of the economic uh, status, uh, social uh, uh, segments of society, uh, the multi-stakeholder engagement. And engagement uh, is, is fundamental. It's not just a, a word to be used but it is to, to really become part of our DNA so that, you know, as uh, uh, some of my uh, critics say, I use the word ownership too much because they call me a neoliberalist, which I'm not, I can tell you that. Uh, uh, but ownership in the sense of owning the problem and owning the solutions and engaging with the problems. And in that, in that creative and that positive sense, uh, ownership of, uh, of the future of Chennai, we have to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, we will try to do that at UEF. We will try to uh, continue and we'll try to engage all different segments of society, including very importantly, of course, the policymakers and the business people. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, you, all of you, uh, Mr. Prakash, who uh, is not here, but uh, uh, in his absence, but also Raul, uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, Pete, thank you for joining from Netherlands. And Hamdan, thank you very much for joining from Malaysia. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.